Joined now by John Kelly, editor of uh, Carlo Viana magazine. How are you keeping, John? Not too bad, Dave, yourself. I'm all good now. Um, a lot of people know you from the music. Not as many people know you from your uh, interest in local history and your involvement with it. How did you get involved in that, John? Uh, Dave, I've been interested in local history since I was a, since I was a chap. Going around the town, looking at all the buildings and the castle, things like that as well. You know, loved it. And I loved Carlo Viana. I couldn't wait for it to come out every year when I was a, when I was a youngster. Um, I collected books as well about Carlo. And, and the surrounding areas, you know, I have a theory that, um, you know, uh, county boundaries are only good for sports, really. You know, after that, you know, how many people in Carlo would sort of, would be associated with Collection, Slaty, Castle Dermot, you know, all these historic places as well. So I have a big, big interest in local history, but local history from the point of view of local as opposed to county. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to have you on doing a few uh, history bites every week. I know this week we're going to talk a little bit about a fella I don't know too much about called Robert Hartpole. Yeah, great character, but uh, you wouldn't like to meet him on a dark night. <laughs> 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 He's one of these guys who actually is, um, he was constable of Carlo Castle in the Tudor times, but um, he actually lived in Shrewl Castle, which is about three or four miles out the road, out by Slaty. Okay. And um, it's a fantastic building, Shrewl Castle. If, if people get to see a lovely um, Elizabethan tower house. And actually, there's a fireplace in it, and Hartpole and his wife's names are scratched into it. Which you can see it from um, from the 1570s. You know, it's, it's amazing to see something like that. But he was a very interesting character. He was born in Kent in the 1500s. He arrived in Ireland as a soldier with two of his brothers, and um, very successful soldier. He got um, lands in Leash then, when Leash was um, planted by by Queen Mary in the plantation of, of Leash and Offaly. Um, and he was also named uh, Constable of uh, Carlow Castle in 1567 by Queen Elizabeth. And part of his job there was to collect a tax called cess. But this was really an extortion record. You know, he had powers of life and death. He had martial law powers. So when he came looking for money off you, you paid up. And there's a really unique document in the, in the English archives. It's a complaint about five pages long about him from people in Michael, Ballon, Kilbride, Clonigal, and Radville. And... Um, so he would go out there and he'd, um, he would say, you owe Cess, and he might take the cow or take something belonging to you as well. But he wouldn't give you a, a pardon, which basically is a receipt. So he'd come back next year and look for the money again. So mm. he was running an extortion racket, really. Mm. And even the poor parish priest in Michel, um had his horse seized off him for 10 days. So fairly ruthless character. But his big place in history is his participation in the Mullah Mass Massacre in 1577, which was where the English settlers in Leash decided they were going to, they were looking really for, for all the land held by the Irish, the Amours and all the other families in Leash. And they invited um, the, the, the chiefs of those clans, the Mullah Mass and Kildare, and they massacred them. And Hartpole was very much implicated in that. And his name was blackened sort of for all time because of that. And he had a very fractious relationship with the Amours as well, particularly Rory over Moore. Um, he was in Lachlan Bridge at one stage as vice constable and he participated in the execution of Conal O'Gormore and um, Morris Cavanagh in 1557. And that sort of soured all the relations between the O'Moores and, and Hartwell. And then over the years then, he was involved in the killing of Rory O'Gormore's wife during a, a rescue to free hostages that Hartwell led. Um, and O'Moore attacked Carlo Castle at one stage and Hartwell would have been involved in fighting them off. So it was a big, uh, a, that was a big thing. So in, especially in Leash, um, uh, Hartpole's name is, is, is very poor. And, and the family were very interested in family. They survived until, um, I think the late 1700s, but they had a, there was sort of a curse on the family. Apparently Hartpole killed a priest and he put a curse on the family. And basically he said, they'll all, they'll all, they will all die very bad deaths. And, um, so that was really interesting. It was called the Hartpole Doom. So, um, so he lived it out and he was, he was involved in a lot of controversies, but he was also a very successful administrator as well and, and for the crown because he got the money and he kept people quiet. But he died eventually in uh, 1594 at 80 years old, which is a huge age for that time. Yeah. And he's buried then in the Church of the Blessed Virgin uh, in Carlo um, on Castle Hill. Would that, would that be St. Mary's there beside the tavern, John? No, it was called St. Mary's Day, but it was the older, as an older church that was associated with the castle. 
No. Um, so the theory is that the castle would have had its own church. And then later on, as the town expanded, it became the parish church. And okay. that church uh, went through the 1641 rebellion, where it was, part, it was in the middle of a siege of the castle. And then also when Ireton, um, Cromwell's general, was bombing Carlow um, with cannons, that church was in the middle of it. So that church got really badly damaged. So it, the new church then was built um, in uh, 1669. They started building a new church where St. Mary's is now at the top of the hill. So what happened then was Harpole was buried there in an effigy tomb. So this is basically a big stone box with an effigy of a knight on top of it. You, you, you've probably seen them in Kilkenny in St. Canis's and places like that. But of course, over the years, the church was, the, the old church was robbed away in terms of stone and stuff like that. And it, it eventually disappeared. But in 1809, they were actually putting the street through Castle Hill and they came across his his um his effigy and his tomb, so this was a this was a huge thing. Eighteen oh nine, they found this, and uh, there was a, a diary from uh, Elizabeth Cole um, from Timmerlin who was there, and she said uh, at that stage it was in high preservation. This this effigy was so it became a huge thing in the town. People were visiting him from all over the town and coming in from the county to see this big picture of a knight. No one knew what he was, so this was going on for a, for a week or so, and suddenly it said a friar or a monk. Now, I don't know what a monk or a friar was doing in Carlow in 1809. I identified it as Hartpole. So, the Grey Glads, the Grey Glads, of course, always have a bad name. They took, they took the pickaxes and, and, and shovels to it and started damaging it. And it knocked the head off it and threw it into the barrel. So, <laughs> Colonel Bruin then decided to take it in hand um, from Oak Park. So, he actually paid the Grey Glads to get back in the river and find the head. And they did, and they brought it out to Oak Park. It was in Oak Park for a number of years um, as a garden ornament. And then eventually, one of Harpole's um, descendants, uh, Harpole Bowen, brought it to Port Arlington. Um, and it was in Kilner Court House there. So that's where it resided for a number of years after Kilner Court House was sold. And it was moved around Port Arlington at that time. And one of the members of the old Carlos Society that's just tried to get it back to Carlow. But there was some local opposition and they couldn't do it. So now it's in the People's Park in, in Port Arlington. And it's, it's a huge, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge effigy. The head is not there, but you can see it's, it's a full length, about seven feet long and about three feet wide. Um, and at the moment, um, I suppose everyone agrees that it belongs in Carlo. So there, there, is some, there is some hope that we'll get back to Carlo soon. But, it, but it, it's, it's a sort of interesting story. Maybe we'll have to send the Grey Glads back in to get it, John. What do you reckon? Well, the Grey Glads are great lads, I'll tell you that. Great time for the Grey Glads. <laughs> They'll get it done. Well, that's an interesting story. Probably just as much interesting after that as he was uh, with, with how the effigy was moved around afterwards. Yeah, that's what I found. And there's a, there's a great story I found in the Leinster Leader. Um, and it's a fictionalized story. But it's, 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 it's a real cliched one. You know what I mean? The wind was blowing, the rain was pouncing on the house. <laughs> the wind was blowing through the trees. The old knight lay on his bed and he raised himself up. And it's this sort of a story, you know. Um, and I don't know what the story was. He, apparently he, he murdered someone's, someone's girlfriend or something like that and he had to confess for the end of it. But it's about, it's about two huge newspaper pages long. At some stage, I'm going to try to, to publish it because it's just, it's of interest. But there's loads of old, there's loads of stuff about the heart You know, there were, there were a strange family. Um, Barrington, Jonah Barrington, who was a barrister, he was related to them. He wrote a book and he said, he said they were the hardest livers in the country. Now, I don't know whether he meant that they had, that they had the best livers for drinking in the country or they just lived hard, but I think it works both ways. <laughs> <laughs> but they were, they, were, they were a really interesting family, you know, and um, they're, 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 um, it's worth reading about them. It's worth, it's worth learning a bit about them. Yeah. Um, and, and, but Robert was very important to him because he was a very senior figure in the Tudor administration in Ireland. And if you look back through the, the state papers for the period, he's mentioned a lot of times, you know, he, he's, he's a very important figure. Yeah, and, and to live to that age was, um, was, was pretty much unheard of at those times, to 80 to, years to of live age. To, yeah, 80 years of age. That, and particularly, you know, he, was a, he wasn't a well-liked man, you know. He, apparently, at Shrewell Castle, there's a little canal that goes up, that's been dug out, that goes up to the castle. And apparently... He used to come to Carlow to the castle in a boat because um, he couldn't he couldn't trust the roads going in by horse into Carlow. 
Okay. Um, because he was he was a marked man. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, very interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I have about, a few more mad characters as well. I'll talk. Yeah, about. that's what we want. <laughs> Every week, uh, we're going to come back to you for a few more um, history bites. As I said. Yeah. Um, Thanks very much for that, John. And I'm sure we'll see you soon, either playing music online yep. or uh, telling us some more about local history. Thanks, Dave. You might see me tonight at nine, actually. Yep. If you're, tonight, if you're nine o'clock, John <laughs> Kelly, live. <laughs> and if any, if, any of the, if any of your listeners uh, want a particular period in Carlow history or local history um, to talk about or any questions, I'd be glad to take them. You know, if you uh, just okay. contact you, Dave. Great stuff. Yeah, just contact me and I'll put you in touch with John. Thanks very much, John. I'll, we'll see you next week. No problem, Dave. Slan. Cheers. Take Thank care. You. Thanks. Bye.